participate in Emmanuel's Child. That's the star in the back to help um, provide some information and uh, Christian Christmas resources to the Slavic um, the Slavic areas of of the world. Um, and that's one of the ways that we've been reaching out. Um, it's a uh, twenty-five dollars. You can grab the star, fill it out, return with a check. Um, can we bring them back next week, or do we need to have a check this week? They need to be in this week. They need to be in this week. So if you got it with you today, great. If not, uh, well, we'll figure something out. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, new people, people checking in online for the first time, and, and people who have been here for a while. Um, it, it's always good to see um, familiar faces, new faces, um, and faces we see every now and then. Um, now speaking of faces we see every now and then, uh, next week is going to be our going away uh, luncheon for the Shelleys. Um, it's going to be a bittersweet uh, time for us but um, yeah so bring some food um, we will be providing beverages um, and that'll be next next Sunday after our service so um, yeah come just celebrate the time that they spent with us um, and the blessing that they've been to our church body also next Sunday it is the end of the month which is two significant uh, events in one one being um, what most people think of Halloween. Um, and that is a very polarizing time of the year. Um, it's very symbolically important to a number of people um, and in ways that are increasingly relevant to them as we go on, um, especially in America. America has been regressing in ways to a more um, new age or, or pagan belief system and more so in years in the past and in decades of the past Halloween is a more symbolically charged time than it had been growing up from my generation and, and my parents generation Halloween was more of a just oh let's go out and have fun and do candy and, and that kind of stuff um, but it's it's becoming more important in in a serious manner to people as the world is is beginning to transition in its its core fundamentals um and and in that it's just an opportunity to reconnect with with a, a reawakening um yearning for spirituality that people are reaching out to uh, we have a number of tracks in the back some of them have a sticker for the church information some of them have a blank spot for you to add some information of your own um, and if, if you are going to participate um, in the candy and, and all that next week, um, think about grabbing some of those and including it with your, um, with your treats. Um, additionally, um, the other significant thing is the anniversary of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses. Um, and we'll be discussing that in more um, detail during Life Group next Sunday. Um, it's always a really interesting um, study. Uh, that really helped kick off uh, a reawakening and a realignment um, in in the Western Church um, away from the institutional Catholicism that had held sway over so much of Europe and allowed the Reformation um, to help realign um, in a more godly manner uh, Christianity in its institutional form. Um, so yeah, so we got those. Uh, scripture reading is going to be Psalm 19, 1 through 6. The law of the Lord is perfect to the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor their words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. In the world and their words to the end of the world in them he has a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit is to the end of them there is nothing hidden from its heat if you would bow and pray with me 
Dear God, we are moving through this year, which is um, which has been a year that you've given us full of interesting turns. Um, we've had unrest, we've had plague, um, we've had societal problems, but through it all, you're with us, and you have shown that you are good to us. We pray that you would help us continue to learn to reflect your light onto this world, to be for the world what you need us to be, and in this in this age and in this time, and in even in these weeks, that you would allow us to be all that you need us to be for those around us. And in your name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Hello again. Such a beautiful day outside. <laughs> Will you stand and join with us as we sing the mighty power of God? starting in verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. I can only imagine how awesome that's going to look. All heaven declares. <laughs> Forever. 
Christ in me. It's new to most of us up here, but I've heard that a lot of you may know this song. So if you know this song, please do sing out. Um, if you don't, it's not too tricky. Um, some timings are a little odd, at least for me. Christ in me. Thank you, Brian, Thomas, Charlotte, and uh, Cameron for leading us out in music today. Um, I thought I'd read uh, out of the scripture this morning on giving uh, Christ's words from Matthew chapter 6. Familiar to us all, no doubt, um, but good to be reminded often uh, about giving alms or offerings in secret. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward you openly. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, wonderful creator that you are, you are indeed incomparable, giving us all that we have. A portion now we give back to you, giving in faith, such as we have, and in obedience. Father, we know the church gives too from the offerings that she receives, and we pray you'd bless our church in her giving, meeting the needs of uh, many that are wanting and perhaps hurting to and suffering, building them up and encouraging them in the faith. Thank you for your scripture, which instructs us how we should live then while we are here on this earth. It's in your son's precious name and his blood that we pray these things. Amen.
Thank you, Dana. That was very, very nice. Such beauty to be found all around us, whether it be in the musical talent gifted by God or in the world around us. In every small detail that you look, you can look as close as you want. God put in so much detail into everything around us that at least I can speak for myself that I don't think I would ever be bored by just being in what he created. And it's just unbelievable how much detail he put in in just a moment when he spoke the world into creation. Will you stand and join with us as we sing for the beauty of the earth? of Psalm 30. I I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. I exalt thee.
all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Inside your bulletin, uh, there are some notes. Um, I encourage you to use those and follow along. Sometimes it's helpful to write some notes and be reminded of things that you were thinking while you were going through the passage with me. Um, I've I, and uh, Our clock is doing some weird things this morning, so I have my phone up here, but as you might see, I dropped it this week, and it shattered. Um, first time I've ever had a phone break. So, But I need the clock, so I've got that up here as well. Um, Well, the message this morning is titled very simply, Are You Ready? Are you ready? That's a question we ask ourselves a lot. Are you ready to go? Out the door? This morning, perhaps, that may have been the question you asked to whoever you came with. Are you ready to go yet? Let me find my shoes. Let me find my phone. Let me find my comb, whatever it is, got to find my Bible, are you ready? Are you ready for the next political season? Are you ready for the next round of vaccines? Booster number one, booster number two, booster number three, booster number four. I don't know where it's going to end, but are you ready? Are you ready? It's a question Christians should ask themselves spiritually. Are you ready? The Lord, Jesus Christ, has promised to return. The church has been waiting for 2,000 years for him to return. And we continue to wait until he comes. But he is coming. He will return. And the question is, are you ready? If you're a follower of Christ, you need to be ready. If you don't know Christ, you need to be ready. I want to talk to both of you this morning, whichever group you fall into. Readiness is an important quality. It's important for everybody in some level. It's important for your kids getting ready for school in the morning. It's important for you going in to take an exam or for a meeting or appointment. It's important for you to be ready. The military has a saying, um, and, and it's important for the military to be ready at all times and any time, to be ready to go. There is a, a saying, uh, it is a French phrase, toujours prêt, and it means always ready. That is the official um, motto of the United States 2nd Cavalry Regiment of the Army. Always ready. Ready to go at a moment's notice. That was the mantra of the Minutemen in the Revolutionary War. The, the reason they were called Minutemen was because they were to be ready to leave the house to go fight in one minute. Gun by the door, gunpowder in its package next to it, ammunition right there, and a knapsack for whatever they might need, ready in a minute. You'd be ready to go anywhere in one minute? The Apostle Paul told his young protege, Timothy, that readiness was essential. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, he wrote this, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready 
in season and out. Be ready. But maybe you're thinking to yourself this morning, well, that's true for pastors and missionaries and seminary professors, but what about the rest of us? What about us regular Christians? Does that really apply to us? Or are we, do we need to be ready? Should we be ready? Should the servants of Christ always be prepared and when called upon to serve? Well, I think the answer is resoundingly yes, and I'm glad if that question entered your mind, and if it didn't, that's okay. Because as we're going to look at our text this morning, we're going to see both an implicit and an explicit warning to those who don't yet follow Christ, so that they too, that they too, will be faced with a quickly returning Son of Man. I want us to see three things this morning about being ready. First is that we need to be ready for Jesus' return. You need to be ready for Jesus' return. What does it look like to be ready? What does that look like? What does that mean? Well, there's three things, three illustrations that Jesus gives us, three little snapshots that help us understand what readiness in his culture and in his time looked like. And the very first mark of readiness is that you need to dress for the occasion. You need to dress for the occasion. You know, you need to know where you're going. You need to know who you're going to see. You need to be ready to dress for the occasion. If I'm going somewhere real casual, you can bet I'm going to be in a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and a tennis shoes. But if I'm going somewhere important or somewhere where I need to be speaking, I'm going to be dressing more formally. You need to dress for the occasion. What does that mean? Let's take a look at our passage, and I'll explain it to us. Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 40. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. So you too be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. As a little footnote there, I hope you noticed how many times the word coming is found in this text. No less than six times. It speaks to us with authority, certainty. It gives us assurance. It is a promise. Verse 36, when he returns. Last part of verse 36, when he comes. Verse 37, when he comes. Verse 38, whether he comes in the second or third watch. Verse 39, was coming. Verse 40, the Son of Man is coming. Do you see that theme? That is undeniably the heart of this passage. It is undeniably the heart of what Jesus is trying to communicate to us. You can rest assured, Jesus is coming. Now the church has been waiting for 2,000 years. And every generation the church believes that this might be the time when he returns, and it might be. But I don't know when but I do know He is coming. I do not know when, but I do know that He is coming. That is the certainty Jesus wants us to have. And so that's what it means to be ready for Jesus' return. And it requires first that we dress for the occasion. And Jesus gives us three, these three pictures. The picture of being dressed, the picture of the lamp, and the picture of the wedding feast to tell us what it looks like to be ready when He returns. And the very first of these is to dress for the occasion. The verse, by the way, in the literal language means gird up your loins. Gird up your loins. Now, that's a phrase we're not very familiar with. What do you mean gird up? That's a word you rarely use. And loins, what are the loins? Are we talking about a pork loin or what? Gird up your loins. 
In Jesus' day, men generally wore a garment that was like a long robe, and it stretched down to the feet. Even today, in many places in the Middle East, men still dress this way. And the thing about that is that if you want to move quickly, and certainly if you want to run, forget it. You're going to literally trip over your robes. But men did sometimes need to move quickly, and men needed to be ready. And the only way they could do that was by removing the, the hindrance. And the gown that went down around the legs was the hindrance. So they would take the bottom of the gown, the bottom of the robes, pull them up and tuck them into the belt girded about the waist. That would allow their legs to be exposed so that they could go and move quickly. That's the idea. Jesus is saying, I'm coming, and you need to make yourself ready. And the first picture he uses of that is of the way we dress. Are you dressed? Are you ready? And when he says, be dressed, it's in the imperative, which is a command. This isn't an optional thing. Jesus isn't saying, hey, it would be really good for you to be ready. Jesus is saying, if you want to be a follower of mine, you need to be ready. You need to be ready for that moment when I come. You need to be busy about my business. Your hand needs to be to the plow. Your feet need to be shod with the preparation for the gospel. You need, be, need to be about your master's business is what he's telling us so it's both a command and, and it's also a state of constant readiness because it's in the perfect tense the perfect tense means ready now and continuing to be ready not well i was ready last night at eight o'clock but you didn't come so i went to sleep no i got ready at eight o'clock and i'm still ready and i'll be ready tomorrow and i'll be ready the next day believer are you ready for christ to come are you spiritually dressed for the occasion of our Lord's return? That's what Jesus is asking us here. The second picture that helps us understand this is, is that we need to equip for the occasion. Not only do we need to dress for the occasion, but we need to equip for the occasion. He says, and keep your lamps lit. Jesus uses the illustration of a lamp as, a proper, as the proper equipment for being ready at nighttime. Now, you've you got to make a little shift in your mind, culturally and time-wise. Back in that time, there was no electricity. Back in that time, you had lamp power and candle power, mostly lamp power. So if you wanted to do anything at night, you had to light a lamp. You had to have illumination. You couldn't do anything. And that's one of the reasons people went to bed when the sun went down. Because there wasn't anything else to do. There wasn't a drive-in movie to go to. There wasn't any internet to access. There wasn't a light switch to flick on. No, there was a lamp. And most families, most poor families, probably had no more than one lamp. These lamps were made of clay, and they were filled with olive oil and a wicker that they would light a wick that they would light and it would burn the olive oil but even that was rather pricey and so it wasn't like a home would be filled with lamps where they burn these every night so people could stay up till 10 o'clock playing jenga you would use the lamp for a special occasion a guest who had come late a meal that needed to be served late but other than that when the sun went down you went to bed Jesus says, make sure you are properly equipped for the occasion. Here he says, keep your lamps lit. So that's kind of extravagant. Yes, it is. But it also allows you to be ready. When the knock comes on the door, that you can see the door. You can go to the door. You can open the door. You're awake. You're alert. You're ready, you're properly equipped. Christian, are you properly equipped for the coming of our Lord? Are you ready for Him? Are you looking for Him? Jesus gave a beautiful illustration in His parable 
about the ten virgins. Do you remember that story in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13? Let me read some of it to you. But at midnight there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose, there were ten of them, and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent ones, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Now here's Jesus' comment. Be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Be on the alert. Keeping your lamp lit meant that you were always ready for whoever ever. Are you spiritually equipped with a lamp that is always lit, ready for our Lord's return? Are you ready? Are you ready? He gives us here in verse 36, wait for the occasion. Number one, we are to dress for the occasion. Number two, we are to equip for the occasion. Number two, we are to wait for the occasion. <clears throat> Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Consistent assurance. When he comes, he is coming. I don't know about you, but when I was a young believer, and I read passages like this, I thought to myself, it's been 2,000 years. He's not here. Now, on the one hand, I'm really glad he didn't come earlier because I wouldn't have been here and I would definitely wouldn't have been ready. On the other hand, I say, well, man, people could kind of kick back for 2,000 years. Jesus didn't come. I used to think like that. Jesus tells us he's coming. That's my assurance. Is he, it, could it be another 2,000 years? It could be. It could be. It could be 20 years. It could be two days. I don't know when he's coming. But I absolutely believe his word is true and he has said he is coming. So I need to wait. Waiting is a hard thing for many of us especially with Christmas coming, right? Remember when you are a kid waiting, waiting for Christmas? My, my grandkids are hilarious. You know, every, it seems like every Christmas we have a present or two that's left over because we have other family that's coming later or a friend we're getting together with later. And so the Christmas tree is there, but the, the, the stash of gifts that were there have pretty much all been given. And, th and there's usually like one that's still sitting there and our grandkids come in, and the first thing they do, they open the door, and they look over for the tree. And every one of them is absolutely convinced that that gift is for them. And they'll go over, and they'll look at it, and they'll look for the name, and, and, and they'll ask us, are you sure that's not for me? It's like there's, there's this anticipation, and there's this way. It's hard for us to wait even if it's someone else's gift. Take a look around you this week sometime, wherever you go, and watch and see how hard it is for people to wait. Uh, Ron and I went to lunch at Chick-fil-A yesterday, and we sat inside and ate, and I watched a couple, a young couple, at the back of the restaurant. They were in, it was almost like a private little booth. And the gal was sitting here, and the guy was sitting here. It was just the two of them. They were not more than two feet apart, and both of them 
after most of the meal sat there like this. They weren't talking. They were both iPhoning. Yeah, probably chatting to each other. It's too difficult to use actual words. <laughs> but whatever whatever was going on in those phones, they couldn't wait. And they missed out. They missed out on the joy of communication and, and, and the joy of getting to know someone. They missed out. Well, we're called to wait. We're called to wait for Christ. He is coming, and we're called to wait for Him. Five of the virgins missed out because they weren't prepared for the wait. And, and notice a very important part of this mini parable. Jesus said, be like the men who are waiting for their master when he returns. The emphasis here is on one simple truth. The master will most definitely return. By waiting for him, however long that may take, they are ready to serve him faithfully, and that faithful service will ultimately bring its own reward, as we're going to see next. Are you spiritually waiting for the Lord's return? Let me talk for a moment about the opposite of waiting. <clears throat> the opposite of waiting is becoming self-absorbed. It's becoming caught up in the stuff and things of this world. It's being focused so that all of our time is consumed on this world rather than our eyes fixed on Christ and doing His work. If, if you're too busy to use your spiritual gift in the life of the church, you're too busy. You're too busy. If you find that there's always something else that needs to be done at home and it keeps you from serving and exercising your spiritual gift, wherever that is, you're too busy. Something needs to go. You're too preoccupied. And man, I know what that's like. Every Monday, my day off, right? First thing I do, I wake up and I go, what needs to be done around here? What needs to be done around here? You know, homeowners, right? If you're a homeowner, you know... There is no end to the stuff that needs to be done. It just never ends. It's relentless. And if we're not careful, we will let that absorb us so that we have no time for the kingdom. Better we should live in the yard in a tent so we have the time to engage the ministry Christ has called us to while we're waiting on Him. So we are to be ready for Jesus' return. What does that look like? It means you dress for the occasion. It means you equip for the occasion. It means you wait for the occasion. Secondly, we are to be alert for Jesus' reward. I love this part. We are to be alert for Jesus' reward. Look at verses 37 and 38. Jesus says, Blessed are those slaves whom the Master will find on the alert when He comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and so finds them blessed are those slaves. Do you notice that the whole passage, that whole mini parable is bookmarked with the word blessed? Blessed are they, blessed are they. Blessing is reward. And the reward here, the reward here is deeply humbling. Blessing and watchfulness go together. I want you to notice two things about being alert for Jesus' reward. Number one, we will be blessed. We will be blessed. But we're also to be watchful. That's the second part. We will be blessed, but we're also to be watchful. These two go together for faithful followers of Christ. And the passage begins and ends with that powerful word, blessed. Blessed. Blessed are those slaves whom the Master will find on the alert when He comes. There's no if in there. It's absolute certainty. He is coming. The question is, are we ready? And, and look at the promise of His return. That promise that return comes with the promise of a blessing. He says, blessed are those slaves who the master will find on the alert. 
on the alert. Alert is another word for ready or watchful or waiting or anticipating. We know he's coming and our eyes are out for him. We have a small bench in our front window, uh, next to the front window in our front room. And again, our grandkids love to climb up on there and look out the window and see what's happening. If they know somebody's coming, like we, we like to do spa parties at Grandma and Bumpa's house. And so the, the grandkids will come and uh, we'll, we'll, they go in the spa. And they usually get a popsicle when they get out. But man, when they, they know they can't get in until the other cousins come. So what do they do? They run to that little bench, they stand up on it, and they look out the window waiting for the car to come. They're waiting, they're alert, and as soon as they see that car come, oh, they're here, they're here, the spa party can start. You see, there's that expectancy. There's that joy in being alert. Are we that joyful when we think about Jesus coming and being on the alert for him? Beginning every day with the thought, this could be the day. This could be the day. I'm not even worried about tomorrow because if he comes today, I don't need to worry about tomorrow. Today. Today is the day he could come. Or when you end the day and, and you take those few moments in prayer, Lord, thank you for today. Lord, you didn't come today, but maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Are you ready? Are you waiting? Are you alert for his coming? Jesus says, truly, I say to you that he will guard, gird himself to serve and have them recline at table and will come up and wait on them. This reward is so awesome, it boggles my mind. Do you remember James and John who came to Jesus? One of the Gospels tells us that their mother came to him, and another one says that they came. Lord, we want you to grant that when you come in your kingdom, we may sit one on your right and one on your left. Why? Those were the premium seats. That meant you were part of the ruling elite. They, they were asking for this incredible blessing that wasn't Jesus's to give. How audacious was that? And yet here Jesus likens his return to a master who when he comes home and he sees his servants alert, he is so thrilled with their readiness for him that once they open the door, he says to them, you guys, Go sit down. I'm going to serve you a meal. I'm going to serve you. But Lord, we're, we're here to serve you. No, no. Today, I serve you. Um, you know, the other picture we have of that that's similar to that is Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And I, and I find myself in Peter's seat. Oh, no, Lord, not my feet. No, Lord. Peter, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. I, I find myself not wanting to receive that kind of blessing from him. And yet that's the promise. That he's going to bless us by serving us. Now, I, I don't know if this is literal or if this is figurative of, of the way that Christ serves us. I don't know. But I, but I know that it is a picture of his great blessing upon us, of his personal presence, his personal ministering to us in some way. I don't know what that's going to look like, but that's so humbling. I, I mean, I, I, I don't even, f I, I feel like John, right? I'm unworthy to untie the thong from his sandal. And you tell me he's going to serve me? That's just... That's overwhelming. It really is. Jesus taught his disciples and he illustrated for them in practice what real leadership looked like. Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28, he, he said this, 
you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercised authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said, guys, this isn't what leadership looks like in my kingdom. Leadership looks like service. And I'm going to serve you. Wow. That's pretty humbling. We will be blessed. Number two, we must be watchful. Verse 38. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so. The so is alert. Whether he finds them alert. Blessed are those slaves. We must be watchful, alert, and waiting for our Lord's return. The, the second and third watch refer, there's two different um, ways of looking at that. The Roman way was that the second watch of the night was from 9 p.m. until midnight, and the third part of the watch was from midnight until 3 a.m. The Jewish accounting for this was basically from 10 o'clock until 6 a.m. But both picture the same thing. It's the middle of the night. It's the middle of the night. It's the time when people are asleep. It's the time when nothing much is happening. Jesus says, if I come at that time, if I come at that time and find you ready for me, you will be blessed. That's what it means to be watchful. To be watchful requires diligence and persistence, and it requires freedom from the things of this world that so easily entangle us. Second Timothy 4.2, Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said this, No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You realize when, when someone goes off to the military, our, our, our second oldest son went and served five years in the Navy, um, you know, when he signed on the dotted line and he reported for duty, that was it. That was it. He, he belonged to them. Where he could go, when he could go, what he had to do was determined, determined by someone else, not him. He worked to please the one who had enlisted him. Paul uses the same imagery to speak to us as Christians. We are on duty in the Lord's kingdom. We have this wonderful song we teach the kids in, nurse, in, 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 pre in preschool here, um, in, in children's church. I'm in the Lord's army. It's pretty close to the truth. We're in the Lord's army. We belong to him. We're to serve him. Mark chapter 14, verse 32. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass, from, pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Christians are called to be watchful. We are called to be watchful. What does it mean to be alert for Jesus' reward? It means first we will be blessed, and secondly we must be watchful. The reward for such watchfulness is the blessing of our Lord's ministry to us. So we've seen that we need to be ready for Jesus' return. We need to be alert for Jesus' reward. And then thirdly, we need to be expectant for Jesus' return. Expectant. I have a uh, chocolate Labrador retriever. And she is more reliable than an alarm clock. Twice a day. When she's ready to eat, she's at the door, pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth, looking in, even though she's blind. She's looking right in, waiting, watching, 
alert. And more than anything else, expectant. I bring her food out, fill it in the bowl, and I make her sit until I tell her it's time to come. And when I tap the last of the food in there, she's sitting there and she looks up at me, and the drool just starts coming out. That's what it means to be expectant <laughs> if you're a dog. Christian, are we, are we so focused on the Lord's coming, so thrilled for that, so expectant about that, that we're just every day, it's as though every day ends and it's a disappointment that today wasn't the day. The day will come, and he will arrive. But here's what you need to know about that. Number one, the unknown time of his arrival. Verse 39 tells us that we won't know when. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Now that's another parable. There's actually three small parables in here. This is the third one. And, and this is the obvious story of a thief coming to break into a, into a house. Now, most of the homes at that time were made out of mud bricks, which meant that the way to break into them was to dig a hole, usually through the backside somewhere. Dig a hole. Nobody would hear you. Nobody would see you. Slip in, grab whatever you want, and away you go. But if you're a faithful steward with servants working under you, you would be alert. If somebody said, hey, this guy's coming to break in at 10 o'clock tonight, You'd be right there ready for him. You'd be prepared. You'd be equipped. You'd be ready. The problem is we don't know when the burglar's coming. We don't know when Christ is coming. It's the unknown time of his arrival that's in view here. Jesus presents a, a difficult situation because no one could know when to expect a burglar or a thief. So, so how do you deal with that? You deal with that by being ready at all times. You have to be ready at all times. 2 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 6, Paul writes, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. The emphasis there is on our readiness. The emph emphasis there is on being alert for Jesus' coming, being expectant. If you're expecting it, you won't be surprised by it. Secondly, we see the certainty of his arrival. Verse 40, Jesus is finished with the parables. Now he brings it all home and he wraps it up for us here. You too, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. The certainty of his coming is reinforced in every single one of these verses. Jesus wants his disciples then and us today to know he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Our responsibility, be ready, be ready, be ready. Christian, are you ready for his coming? John concludes the book of Revelation with his beautiful plea in chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. And then John adds these words. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's the cry of the prepared heart who longs for Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you alert? Are you expectant? The Lord is coming. Let's pray. Father, the church longs for your arrival. As one generation passes another, still we long for your coming.
long enough for the fulfillment of your promise, that day when you will come, a day when you will make all things right, all things new. And Lord, we pray for those who are not ready, those who have not yet placed their faith in Christ. And Lord, even today, if there are some here who could not answer the question, are you ready, with an affirmative, Lord, may today be the day that they would cry out to you and say, Lord, I I want to know Jesus. I want the grace that you offer. Lord, give me a childlike faith to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and my Savior. Lord, may your church be ready and may we be quick with the gospel to help others be ready as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, men's group Tuesday night guys we're going to finish up our book uh, and the last chapter is on reward so hope to see you there it's our very last study uh, in this book and uh, the practice of godliness it's been a blessing to many um, and uh, Wednesday night prayer so I want to encourage you to look for the link for that and that's what's coming up and then next Sunday uh, bring a lunch because we're going to celebrate um, the Shelleys as they get ready to leave and I think you guys are leaving on the Wednesday following, something like that? It's, oh. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't sound, he sounded a little more open. Bill, you and I got to go to lunch. <laughs> Bill's not ready. <laughs> Lily's ready. Uh, well, you guys have a great week. Be here, come and join us and celebrate with them afterwards. Um, have a good week in the Lord. Thank you.